And so we have we have a, a fair amount of time for questions, right? Yeah, we're good. And Perfect. I'll go around and once I, I get a, I have a question I want to answer from Bob too. Okay. So go for it. Okay. So I keep hearing that botanical approaches are more efficacious than pharmaceutical antibiotics and not nearly as detrimental. What's your experience with this? Um, I think that's an awesome question um, because <laughs> I find that it's very patient specific. I mean, I, I tell people I'm will, in most cases I'm happy to do antibiotics and pharmaceuticals <coughs> or herbals alone or in combination, but the vast majority of people I do in combination and it kind of depends on what's going on with them. I've seen some people do remarkably well with the herbals and antibiotics don't touch them. And I've seen the exact opposite happen where the person comes in, I want her herbals, 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 and you finally, like a year later, convince them to do antibiotics and they get better. So I, I think it's gotta be individual. And you know, going back to the thing I said about the school, that's not a good place to be. Um, the thing at the school is like, they're a big organization that has to um, you know, go back and say, you know, be accountable to the state and follow these rules and regulations. And anybody who's outside of that, it makes their life harder. And in our practice, we see all the people who have been pushed aside and we're like, hey, look, we have to treat you as an individual. So every person gets an individualized treatment protocol. And I've seen, like I said, I've seen people do great either way and most commonly I end up using both. One of the tricks I did mention was at the end of a treatment protocol, you know, I said, oh, reassess and treat them until they're symptom free and then so long. And if you talk to Ray Jones, it's always two months. I say, well, but that means some form of treatment. So a lot of times, once people are really good, um, I'll transition them to herbals because they do have less side effects. And maybe I'll extend that treatment for six or eight months rather than just doing it for two months so that I give them a little more protection. I think the other part of the question was, um, you know, what's wor sort of worse for the body. And I think pharmaceuticals certainly have the potential to be worse, but we have to treat you with the appropriate probiotics, anti-inflammatories, detox agents, and stuff like that. Um, and certainly I think for most people who don't have allergy, the herbals are a little less toxic to the body, um, but you gotta see a doctor who knows how to balance both of those. So we have a dentist here today, and she says thank you for your comments on airways. Um, she's curious Thank to Thank you for knowing about airways. Because <laughs> most of the dentists I know don't know about airways. Um, she's really curious to know how you correct one stained dentin from tetracycline. So that's a great question that I don't remember the answer to. Um, but the gentleman who is sitting on my lap with his finger in my daughter's mouth, he, he, he knows that stuff. So if you grab me after, I can certainly um, get you in touch with him or find the information for you. Do you think that some people who have trouble recovering from Lyme disease are having challenges adequately detoxifying biotoxins? Um, so biotoxins, um, I, I think I use it two ways. One is sort of the Richie Shoemaker way, which is, you know, you're having a hard time detoxing the Lyme toxins or mold toxins. And I certainly see that as a big issue. But I think environmental toxins, um, you know, in general are, can really hold people back. Um, and I think that you really need to kind of think about that in your treatment protocols and going back to not only uh, evaluating detox pathways, evaluating MTHFR status, evaluating some of the other mutations somebody may have, um, but just general stuff. I do a lot of um, micronutrient testing just to make sure people have B vitamins and minerals and antioxidants to even start being able to do this. So I like to start from the ground up. And also, it's the toxin binders, I think, are really important um, to, once you mobilize those toxins and they're getting into the colon, we want to be able to get them out of the body. Part of that toxin binding and the way to get biotoxins out of the body also has to do with regularity of bowel movements. So if I give you a whole bunch of, to like cholestyramine, I use a little less frequently because it's very constipating. And so if I give you a toxin binder to help to get the toxins out of your colon and it binds them into your colon, it, it, it doesn't do as good a job. So I kind of use some of the other things like the Takasumi Supreme. There's some shellfish extracts you can use. But um, use some binders and get the, you know, get the toxins out. Do you believe that Lyme disease is in the same family as syphilis and therefore potentially sexually transmitted? 
Well, I thought this question came before lunch, and I had dodged it. Yeah, and I'm sure Rich will be talking about it. The thing I know is definitely in the same family as syphilis, but the question of sexual transmission is, is, is interesting um, because, um, you know, we can culture spirochetes through semen and on the cervix. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is um, a sexual tra sexually transmitted disease. There's, to my knowledge, and maybe Dr. Horowitz um, has some more updated information for later, but um, so far the information shows it. There's a small possibility it might be possible, but we haven't really confirmed that. And then I'll leave you in suspense for later. Um, but again, I mean, think about this. If you like to hang out in your yard or your house, and I find ticks in my house if, if, you know, at times, and then I started spraying and now I don't. But, you know, I still have cats and dogs. It is, it's just the way I am. But, um, you, it's a paradomestic disease. If, and one of, some of the oldest research from the early 70s shows if you take ticks way over there and you take ticks way over there, so you, so you basically had them together and then you separate them, very quickly they'll be genetically dissimilar strains of Lyme. And so the thing is, if you guys have a strain of Lyme that's identical if you and your partner do, maybe the other thing is you could have gotten bit from ticks that hang out in the bush out in front too. So, I mean, the problem is a lot of us hang out with our, our partners in area, and our children in areas where that hap you know, where they're going to get exposed to the same population of ticks. Um, so that's important. The other thing, um, it just kind of came to mind, I think it's really important, especially with children, and mothers really, um, I just, I, I don't know how moms are moms, I really don't. I, I'm married to a mom, and she's incredible. I, I really don't know how moms do it. <laughs> but the thing is, I get asked all the time, did I give my kid Lyme disease or some co-infection? And so the, the thing, it, you know, from my experience, the experience of Dr. Jones, who I've talked to a lot about this, is if the kid is pretty much normal through six or 12 months of age and then they get sick at four or seven, it's probably an acute exposure or something, you know, post-mom. So, a lot, you know, a lot of times I can sort of ease sort of the, the concern that moms have. Um, so. Last one before I open it up to the audience. Have you had success treating Lyme without antibiotics? Absolutely. Um, yeah, again, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of figuring out what all the pieces are. I often tell people, you know, as an osteopath, I think about it as the body has priorities, right? So if you have 10 things that are bothering it and going, sort of going wrong, if you will, and you need, your body is going, I need help with number one and number two. Number one, I can't handle gluten. Number two is I've been constipated for 16 years. Um, they're probably bad examples because if you can't ha handle gluten, it's probably not the same thing. <laughs> probably diarrhea. But if you don't focus on those, I don't think you can ever get rid of Lyme because your immune system's shot. But if Lyme is number one and number two is Bartonella, you're going to be able to treat it quickly with just, you know, just with that treatment. So it's just about prioritizing your treatments. And the herbals, I think, really do um, allow us a lot of freedom. The nice thing is with herbals too is they're not, I mean they say A Bard or MCBB1 for Borrelia burgdorferi, but really they're a little more broad spectrum than that. So they, they do allow us to um, treat a lot more things with a lot less toxicity. So I think it's possible to do it with any of those treatments as long as we're prioritizing. Um, and with my statement that maybe Lyme and Bartonella may not be the most important thing in a particular patient. I still think they almost always need to be treated by us in some way. Um, the, the studies that were done by Monica Embers that show persistence of Lyme in monkeys when they're treated, you know, with four months of infection, uh, a month of doxycycline, 100% infectivity, one month of uh, ceftriaxone, two months of doxy, 73% are still infected. Well, the control group, none of the monkeys got better if we didn't treat them. So despite the fact that we may have other priorities in our body that, we, that are keeping us from getting better, we still need to go treat those tick-borne illnesses. Let's go to our first question. Thank you, Doctor. This has been very, very helpful. Um, my question is, once you have had Lyme or Lyme and its co-infections and your autoimmune system has been compromised, do you think, from your experience, that the autoimmune system in the future is possibly the threshold, so to speak, for what will bother it ha is lowered as a result of having had that, or um, 
for example, in my case, I had Lyme disease for several years and then I was supposedly okay. But I have fibromyalgia as a continuing autoimmune thing. And my question is, is that a change in my autoimmune status or is it really a chronic form of Lyme? Right, and you know, I, it's, it, that's an awesome question, and I, I see this a lot in adults and in children, and it's hard to say in a particular one case versus another, you know, for sure, but I definitely, I see both things happening. I see people who are still chronically infected, and, and I see people who are not chronically infected, but they have that autoimmune uh, potentiation, if you will. But I also most commonly see they're still infected and they have autoimmune potentiation. And so this is really common in our pandas kids. And I think the nice thing about kids is they're kind of like brand new vehicles. And we're, I'm, well, I'm a used car. A few of the rest of us might be older models. And the thing is, um, the kids respond really well. Um, and a lot of times what I'll see is that a kid is doing fantastic. I mean, they're literally asymptomatic for six months. And their parents don't want to come off any treatments. And we're all worried. And they get exposed to one thing at school. And it, they go through the ceiling. And the problem with the infection-induced autoimmune encephalopathy, which I think is a much better term than pandas, although much harder to say, um, <laughs> is that we, until we've turned off that hyperimmune response, that potentiation, any exposure to anything that's a noxious toxin could potentially trigger you. So in, in my case, I use a lot of low-dose naltrexone to help with that. Um, a lot of the other herbals particularly. I don't find a lot of pharmaceuticals outside of LDN are very helpful there unless people um, have um, documented what they call anti-neuronal antibodies. We can find, you know, your, um, there's a molecular labs will do a panel to, to find that your body's actually going after your brain and some people need intravenous gamma globulin in that case more commonly in children with the autoimmune encephalopathies. But, but, but it's, a, it's a key problem because you could have either or or both. And um, it's just a matter of, I think if you have ongoing symptoms, something's going on. I'm, I'm not a, I'm a bad doctor. I can't just give up with 50%. And here's another example. Um, I had a gal, when I remember this, because it was like I had just studied with Dr. Horowitz and I'm like, I'm gonna go save the world. And you know, <laughs> I, you know I thought I learned something and I did clearly, but um, this girl comes in and she's in her 25 or 26, something like that, and her dad's this super huge guy, and her mom's this little Filipino lady, and they're dragging her in with her arms over her shoulders, and she's like, like two months ago I was fine, something happened, and now she's like got this thing going on, and she can't do anything. Work found her in her car in a park. She's a visit, uh, like a traveling nurse, visiting nurse. They found her in her car, just sitting there staring, not knowing what was going on. And so I was like, wow, I think this girl has Lyme disease. I'm really scared because she'd seen two infectious disease doctors and they said no. So we tested her. She came back CDC positive. Um, and so that wasn't even, no, nobody had a question about that one. And so then we treated her and we treated her and we treated her. And like 18 months into the treatment, she was like, man, I'm 80% better. That sucks. I thought I was going to get 100% better. And I was like, man, I, I wish there was something I could do. And then she got pneumonia. And it took about a month to treat the pneumonia. And two months after her pneumonia cleared, she was at the EMS climbing school in North Conway, New Hampshire, you know, climbing up the side of a sheer rock face on all these ropes. So I think what happened was she had that acute pneumonia. And oh, the rest of the story is about a year later, she started to have symptoms again. And she said, oh my gosh, I know exactly what this is. She called up, we gave her one month of AL complex. She was completely fixed. And a year later, she calls me up and says, I want to get pregnant. Is that safe? I said, well, you haven't had any symptoms in the last year. It sounds good to me. I saw the baby after the baby was born. Baby's healthy. Mom works full time. She married a guy who uh, started a custom carpentry business. So she had two full time jobs and then added the kid on top. So that's three full time jobs. And she's completely fine. And I think what happened was that pneumonia was the thing that reset her immune system. So I've seen it work. I've also seen the pneumonia do it the other way. That's kind of more common where you spiral. But I've seen, you know, an acute infection can really, you know, stimulate to re the reset. And that's the biggest problem with these autoimmune things. Hello. My question is, um, have you experienced, um, or have your patients experienced issues with dental issues? So teeth rotting from the inside out. And if so, how does that go in with treatment? What do you find with that? 
I, I have seen a couple people like that. I can't say I have enough experience to know what the right treatment is. Um, I think a lot of times it's um, some of it's just the alteration of the oral flora, that and and you know just like our gut flora gets altered, it can be that. Um, and you know the problem is going back to sort of my priority list is there's so many things your body can handle, and you get you know you get that straw that broke the camel's back. Um, a lot of these kids with the airway issues will have laryngopharyngeal uh, reflux, and so when they have, so that's basically um, saying you have GERD, you have acid reflux, but it can go up into your nose, and so if you're getting ref if you're getting acid in the mouth, you can certainly damage the enamel, and that's another possibility. Um, I don't know that I can that um, that I know that any tick-borne illness will directly demineralize or de ruin the you know the teeth or, or ruin the enamel. Um, but um, I've certainly seen one or two cases that I'm highly suspicious, but I don't have enough experience beyond that. Um, the other thing, too, is with the uh, functional appliance you're talking about, that I, I'm like, um, not only does it promote a great airway and the proper fun myofunction, the function of the tongue, it allows the face to develop properly. And the idea behind it is the more our face can function normally, the more the teeth or the dentition is better. So the whole idea is to have great oral dentition, um, health, and then that leads to body-wide health from, from that way. And in the end, the nice thing is you end up with like a broad smile that looks like all the people from the Weston Price research before they ate McDonald's. And so you have this wonder, and, and then you get, you get your braces done for the same cost, but now instead of just looking cool, um, you actually are healthier. Um, it's ironic that you would say something about um, that girl, almost like a seizure. They found her staring. Um, a week ago, my son, who never had a seizure before, um, at work, he had a seizure. And he was bitten by a tick when he was about three years old and at bullseye and everything. And we were told, because at the time it wasn't such a knowledgeable, knowledgeable thing, that it was a spider bite. And he, um, he's had emotional problems before. But now he seizured, and then they said that when they did the MRI and the CAT scan, and we're still, you know, he's on seizure medicine now for no real apparent thing other than they found a cyst in his brain. So they, we had a test, and it came out negative. Should he be retested for? Have you ever seen anybody seizure, I guess? I mean, other right, than right. what you just said, the girl. Right. This was a full seizure. Yeah, um, so most commonly, at least in children, um, we're thinking that seizures are called, most likely going to be caused, if at, by anything, by Bartonella Hensley infection. And all of my kids who have seizures that we think are from Lyme disease, you know, from a tick-borne illness, have pretty strong Bartonella um, titers. Um, I cheat, I force Quest, and I very nicely force them to send to their Valencia lab um, to do Bartonellas as well as to Igenix because um, uh, it used to be called specialty labs, so the combination of Quest Valencia and Igenix, usually one of those will give us a decent result on a Bartonella, and I know like, like Galaxy does one, um, but I, I like um, the Quest one because it's free, you know, it goes through your insurance, and, and Igenix does a great job as well. But just something to think about with diagnosis. Um, I haven't seen um, Lyme per se be for sure causing seizures, but the problems it can cause encephalitis, and which is inflammation of the brain, and it can cause meningitis. So I mean, um, it's certainly possible. But in my experience, Bartonella has been sort of more the thing. And Dr. Jones, who I, I refer to Dr. Jones because um, I think he was an attending physician for 15 or 20 years before I was born, and he's seen about 20,000 Lyme patients or more, and I have not. As much as I try real hard to fill my schedule, it's there's not that many hours in, a, in the next millennia. Um, and so in his experience, that's also been uh, the case. Hi, um, I was interested in the uh, device that you inserted into your child's mouth. Is that something that's available from a standard um, orthodontist? Unfor <laughs> unfortunately, um, the, the alpha appliance is about as, uh, it might be a little less available than a Lyme doctor. <laughs> it's so, very difficult. I'm it, a pediatrician, in my right. experience, to get orthodontia for people that are as young as your daughter, actually even under seven or eight, my, even when they obviously need it. Right. And so the thing is, this is um, 
I presented this to one of the natural dentists in our area who does standard stuff, but he just makes it like a spa thing so he can make some money. And he's a super nice guy, but he'll tell you that too. So, um, true. But anyway, his, I convinced him to go to the course on this, you know, and they have to spend like $14,000 twice to learn how to do this. Um, and so it's not, the you know, it's hard, but they go because they help people. I sent, my youngest was two years and eight months. So if I, if I can rewind just a second. When I went to see Dr. Kundel, because he's a mercury-free holistic dentist, he said, your daughter needs a bioblock, and that's basically a big piece of plastic that's horrible. Um, and the problem is it moves your tongue out of the way, and it doesn't let your body function in its normal way. And when you're all done, things are better, but you have to now put the tongue, and they fall apart unless the tongue goes back in the right place, which means years of therapy. So um, he said, you need that. I said, no way. And I mean, she needs an ALF. And this goes on. He's like, bioblock. I'm like, ALF, bioblock, ALF, for like you know a year and a half. And I come in one day, and he says, your daughter needs an ALF. I said, we'll be here next week. And we, we started. She was one of his test cases. So we've, we've known about it for a while and worked with it a little bit. So that was helpful. Um, fast forward. Dr. Kundel, who, who took the leap with us, um, I sent him a two-year, two-year, eight-month-old boy who's got severe developmental delays, and his his parents are just like the sweetest people. He's had antibiotic treatment and herbal treatment because he has Lyme and co-infections, and he's made a little progress. And I convinced him to go there because I thought he really needed it, and he definitely had some airway restriction and other things. Within a month, they're like. He said words he's never said before, his mobility is better, we're getting letters from school, and yada, 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 yada. So he needs all the things, but he's doing so well that his dad signed up for, now his mom's going. The girl who with the Abilify, her brother went to, to a dentist who does that. Um, and then all of, a, cause all of a sudden he had problems that she had never told me about, and he became a patient. And now, you know, mom's going, and dad's an interventional cardiologist who's like, what's going on? So, but it's really important, um, you know, to, to look at um, our children of all ages. I mean, I have a lady right now who came up from a, a really well-known um, person from New York, doctor from New York City, referred her up to me, and they're like, do I have Lyme, do I have Lyme, do I have Lyme? And I'm just like, it doesn't look like it, but she's always sleeping. She's super tired, lots of pain, and she finally came in one day, and, and this was last year, and I, I'll never forget it. She goes, all right, I'm sick and tired of what the, because the other guy would always call it micromanage, you know, and, and she's like, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm coming in for a new appointment next week where you're going to look at me as an osteopath and forget all this other jazz. And so we looked at her, and she went, and she, we ended up referring her to my dentist friend, and when we looked at that thing, your airway minimum is supposed to have, whatever the number is, is 150 on that scan. Hers is 31. He said it's the smallest he or radiologist has ever seen. So, but her sleep study was normal. And, you know, so she's going to start the therapy. So just something that, you know, when we're not getting better, look for the co-infection. Look for the co-toxin or the co-troublemaker. So um, there are places you can go. I think it's alforthodontics.com is a lady out in Colorado has a list of dentists. And if not, you can contact my office. And I know the guy who does a lot of the training for dentists, and we can put you in touch with them. But ALF Orthodontics. Thank you. You're welcome. We, uh, we really appreciated your presentation. Will you be our doctor? <laughs> the million okay, dollar here's, question. Here's my serious question. Um, is it possible for a person to have an extremely, extremely mild case of TBDs which can resolve spontaneously without treatment? You know, um, I would love to give you some research on that because that's probably, that would be nice. But in my experience, you know, there, it's interesting. Um, I saw somebody, one of my first cases with, with Dr. Jones, there was a family. Mom and dad were sick and two of the three kids were really sick. And so these other people all had the, like the, the wishy-washy Western blot, you know, barely anything. And they were super sick, you know, your classic chronic Lyme patient. And then so they said, oh, little Johnny, we should test him. And they're like, well, what's the deal? Like, he had no symptoms whatsoever. And like, when everybody asks, I mean, it's like a lot of times people say you have no symptoms, and the next week you realize all the symptoms they had. Literally no symptoms, perfectly normal child. He had like a Christmas tree Western blot. The whole thing was like that. And he clearly had been exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi, 
but really they don't remember him being sick and it could have been that he had something so um, I do think there are cases where your body can do it I mean people got Lyme disease and lived way before antibiotics existed. I mean, we know that you know Native Americans have written about Lyme-like illnesses. We know that in amberized ticks 13 million years ago, there's Lyme, there's rickettsial infections, I think 100 bil uh, million years ago. So I, I believe the body can do it. I think the difference we're seeing now versus, say, in the early 1900s, the, the mid-1900s, is our level of toxicity is just dramatically higher these days. And I remember like the last five years, I'm always like, I've never seen people, just with acute sickness, you know, it's like you are uh, upper respiratory infections. Never seen people so sick and sick for so long, but every year it's more and more. So there's so much negativity and evil in the world that there's not enough really good stories and that, you know, that going back to that love thing. I do think that our bodies are getting overloaded with these toxins and that's making it less common. But I do think our body has the ability to do it on its own, especially if we take care of it. Hi. A little loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, so I understand that it's, it's possible and uh, it's somewhat reliable to um, test a patient's blood for these um, co-infections. Um, is it possible? And if so, um, do you get lower false positive and false negative rates from testing a tick itself? Um. So testing the tick, my understanding is that you actually could probably get a much better result because you have a very small tick and you just cut the thing open and look for it. The question is, did that tick give it to you? you know, but yeah, I think tick testing is a little more accurate. And um, you know, with Lyme disease, if you look at the two-tier testing, I mean, it's like a 50-50. I don't remember if Bob went over that part. I showed up about halfway through his. But I mean, it's a flip of a coin whether the two-tier system will work. And in co-infections, I mean, you'll be lucky if it's that good. Just have a quick, uh, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know. There are actually two different kinds of bio, they call that biomimetic appliances for the mouth. Uh, one is called the DNA appliance, and the master instructor of that is Dr. David Singh, S-I-N-G-H. Um, there are many dentists that do this technique, but you have to find somebody local because, for instance, I'm in Scranton. Obviously, somebody who's in Binghamton does not want to want to come to Scranton every four weeks to get a little tweak of their appliance done. And the other one is the um, Alpha Appliance, and the instructor for that is Dr. Gerald Smith in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. And so both of those people have a long list of dentists that are trained in both the alpha appliances and the DNA biomimetic ones. Yeah, and in, you know, the thing is I drive an hour and a half every four weeks for my daughter, and it's a pain in my rear end, but it's totally worth it. Um, and the other thing, you know, uh, Jim Bronson, who's down in Maryland, uh, trained sort of in Derek Nordstrom, who's the guy who created this uh, alpha appliance in, in his um, sort of direct tradition. And, uh, Jerry Smith certainly is on the list of people. He's done some really cool publications on the ALF, too. I think that's going to be all. We have to thank Dr. Moorcroft for his presentation.